It's recording. Hello. Hey Dave, how are you? Yeah, I'm very well. I've I've uh, had a bit of, bit of a tight haircut, as you can see. Yeah. And I'm looking yeah, at myself. You're looking on, good. Oh, thank you. Uh, looking at myself on the camera here, and oh, I don't know. I'm not not too sure, but it'll grow back. That's the thing about my hair. It kind of. Yeah. Grows. I I have contemplated a lockdown grade one but the problem is i think there'll be sections of it that don't exist anymore so i'm i i, I would be a bit nervous to go all the way um you know it's just just the way it is it's the sort of thing that you could get away with now perhaps you know and, and never again because once yeah. it's all over we'll, we'll be out in the world again and I know, I know, and I, I know, I, I really want to grow a beard, but again, I just don't have it in me. Don't have the manliness to grow a beard. More than like a four o'clock shadow. Have you ever done no, it? No, see, no, see, Anna's. She's pretty hot on that. She won't go near me if if I don't shave. It's just one of our things, you know. Never figured it out, but there we go. The opposite with Jess. If I go too close, she doesn't like it, which I. Anyway, less about that. Let's talk about some of your music. Yeah. So, um, for those of you watching who aren't perhaps aware of Martin and his work, Martin was the frontman and principal songwriter of a band called Delirious. Now, let's hear it from the horse's mouth once and for all. Does it matter if there's a question mark on the end or not? Um. This internet is crashing. I'm going to go to another room and see if you've crashed. Oh dear, I'm sorry. Dave, you've crashed already, or it might be me. I don't know. Hang on a minute. I'm just going to go to another room. Am I back yet? Yeah, you are. It <laughs> might be because I've got 13 children on, on the internet all doing schoolwork. Oh, right. Um, right, is that, any, is that any better? Um, well, you never, you never went anywhere on me. I, I right. went on you, I think. Okay, great. So start again. So just the question about Delirious as a as a um a brand, do we does it matter if we include the question mark or not? That's that's the kind of what I want to know from the horse's mouth, straight off the bat. Um the the question mark uh, came originally as a design thing, um because there were five in the band and we thought it was somehow cool at the time to uh, incorporate a question mark, which was like, are we delirious? Is it delirious? What is delirious? And then the question mark sort of incorporated the five. And so it was a, it was a, a, cl a clever little thing that Stu Smith came up with and uh, it stuck. So there we go. Yeah. So I was just saying for those who don't know much about you, who might be watching, um, you were the, the principal songwriter and, and frontman of this band called Delirious, who yeah. sort of existed as a band from, what, 1996 to 2009? Yeah, prop I think properly is when we left our jobs and, uh, you know, went full time, went on the road. 96, 97. Uh, I think it might have been the April of 97. It was April, the F April Fool's Day, I remember, when we started work as a band together, which is quite amusing. Um, and I think that the record that we were making at the time was, was King of Falls, so it was quite apt. Yeah, nice segue. Yeah. And uh, so we're, we're, we're not gonna look at King of Falls. Um, that has been uh, covered by other people. Um, so we're gonna jump straight into 1999 and talk first about this one. Wow. Which uh, for me, just speaking personally, this is the this is the album that got me into what you guys were doing. Hmm. I I'd heard King of Fools. I'd heard the uh, the band you're in, the, the sort of project you're in prior to that, Cutting Edge. I'd heard that stuff and liked it. But yeah, I I got into what you're doing for myself through hearing this. Um, wow. And uh, it really grabbed me. I mean, I I was. 15, 16 at the time, and listening to a whole lot of um, guitar bands. And uh, this, for me, made me sit up and listen because it kind of, 
it was similar, I think, in its feel to some of the stuff Radiohead were doing. Yes. U2. Yeah. Sort of the, yeah. the 90s U2. Yeah. Octane yes. Baby and, and Pop and that kind of stuff. Because there's a, there's a real yeah. electronic kind of underbelly to this foundation to this album. There's a lot of electronic sounds, aren't there? Yeah. I mean, I, I remember, I think the most important thing about the record for us at the time was the sonic side of it. It was the sonic sort of landscape of, let's take the drums, let's just put them through a guitar pedal, let's, let's do the opposite of what people are expecting from us. You know, the previous record was quite a soft sounding, a sort of blown up folk record in a way. Uh, beautiful acoustic sounds, choirs, beautifully recorded pianos. We recorded it in a big manor house somewhere. I think this was then like, okay, let's try and go the other way and put some aggression into what we were doing. And also that's where we were at, at the time. We, we were lining ourselves up with those bands, like you say, you know, Manic Street Preachers. Uh, Radiohead, um, you know, I remember listening to the Benz record and it's, uh, you know, OK Computer just mm. blowing my mind mm. um, how you can make music like that. So I think that all those were massive inspirations to us at the time. And, uh, you know, I remember just kind of like going, well, let's just have fun with us. Let's just really mess this up. Yeah. So there's five of you in the band and um, yourself as singer and guitarist and well, you play piano as well. I know you write on piano. Um, and then you had a guy called Stu playing guitar. I yeah. kind of have it in my mind that you two sort of were quite united on, on your sort of directed direction as a band and, and what sounds you were going to pursue. Is there more to it than that? I mean, explain a bit about how your dynamic as a band, as a creative team worked. Sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think Stoogie and myself were predominantly the ones pulling the songs together. But of course, it's always more uh, sort of beautiful than that in terms you've got five people rubbing shoulders, ideas, comments. What if we did this? What if we did that? And our personalities would go in this melting pot and out comes, you know, music that is made by five people. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, Stu, Stu and I would write together for a three week block or something. We'd make some demos and then take those to the guys. Uh, but it was never in isolation. I think we were always teaming it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Stu being such an incredible guitar player, um, you know, a lot of the riffs would come from him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know, you know, I remember the, the sort of heaven riff, oh, 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 you know, you know, that riff probably would have come first. And then suddenly I'd be dancing around the room going, oh, what about a walk through, the you know, so very much a team. And um, so, I mean, what a musician and uh, incredible, incredible guitar player. One of the best in the world, I, I would say still. Mm -hmm. And you're working with Jack Joseph Peeg? Yeah, Puig. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. He, he's quite a well-known producer, worked with people like John Mayer, um, yeah. Daniel Beddingfield. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so what was his role sort of with this project? What would the difference well, we, be between the, the finished product and the sort of the demoing sort of level that you were just talking about? Yeah, sure. Well, we we decided to record the record ourselves. Uh, I've got an engineering background, and so we bought some kit. We went to um, a little place near, near where we were in Ford in Arundel, and we just hung out there for weeks and weeks and recorded it. And then we took it to California, uh, where J J Jack Joseph Pui mixed it. If you go on Pro Tools, any Pro Tools nerds out there, you can download Wave software from JJP. And that is 
the the Jack Joseph Puy. You know, but the great thing is I got the chance to actually work with him in person. And in those days, we were Ocean Way in California and uh, with a massive 96 channel focus right desk with all his analog stuff all banked behind. So I've actually touched the original, um, you know, tube tech compressors and, you know, and all that stuff that he, um, the Fairchild that he owns. So anyway, that's a bit nerdy, but well, if his I remember, sound was incredible. Um, with him, I think he, he, <laughs> he buys a new uh, channel strip for every, almost every channel setting he's ever used and then keep yeah. it like that. Um, yeah, he was, uh, he was an extraordinary guy, very eccentric. Um, he hadn't worked in our genre a lot. Um, I think he was very, very suspicious that we were kind of like a Christian band or whatever you want to call it, because we'd come out of the church scene. He was really suspicious. <laughs> we worked on everything from Rolling Stones, Google Dolls, everything, he, you name it. And then there's little us from Littlehampton say, hey, can you mix our record? And um, we sent him a song and he was like, fair play, let's do it. So he, he actually transformed the record in the end. I think he had brought it, all I could say is he brought it louder and more to the front. And, um, you know, I mean, the mix is unbelievable. Um, probably the best mixes we've ever had in, in a sense, uh, apart from rec in recent days with Sam Gibson. But um, that was a real experience. And I think he put his stamp on it and made us believe in the record more. You know, he'd be saying, this is really, really good. And when you hear it from someone that is doing everything, you, it gives you, gives you great confidence. Yeah, I bet. And then a few years later, he made one of my favourite albums, which is Heavier Things by John Mayer, which is good. Yeah. Um, quickly touch on a couple of the songs on the record. So you've got, uh, you've got this kind of, this opening salvo, should we say, of Mezzanine Floor, Heaven, and then Follow. And there's a kind of mm. melodic motif that runs through each of those songs, which kind of ascends. I don't know if you even know what I'm talking about. Right. <laughs> but that kind of do, 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 sort of, you can hear that in the melody in e each song. Yeah, and yeah. And it, it, it ties together really beautifully. Um, yeah, it's yeah. A, I, my observation is it's a really well-constructed album in that sense yeah who of you was sort of oversaw and had the mastermind of the whole thing would you say that was more more of you or more Stu? well I, I i think um it you know if you're at the heart of the songs you probably have an overview of a record quicker uh, because you're sort of living, you're living every what you want to say, what you're trying to say, and also you don't even know sometimes what you are saying until later, uh, till six months in, you think, oh, there is a thing developing here. There's this certain emotion that's evolving in me, or or, or this theme that I'm keep on gravitating towards, or I'm struggling with this, so I'm writing about it. So I think as the writer, and predominantly I was more, more of the lyricist, I guess, you, you do feel the heartbeat of a record more. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to sequencing it, at mastering, you also feel the heartbeat of that as well, you know, the, the progression of the journey about what you want to say. Um, I'm just looking at songs. Um, you know, it, it, it's right that we ended the record with Blindfold and Kiss Your Feet. You know, it's, it's a very sort of the end of the record. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it starts in quite a robust way. Yes. Um, and, you know, I think that's, that, that's probably good if it had been the other way around. It probably wouldn't. So the um, the last four songs have always struck me as a kind of uh, a sequence that that 
works really well as well. So Beautiful Sun, Love Falls Down, Blindfold and Kiss Your Feet. Um, have you got any clear memories of writing any of these songs? Anything that makes you sort of, if you think about this album, what songs do you immediately remember writing? Yeah. Um, it's okay, I think. Being in America at the time and we met someone, we, we, we met this girl backstage and um, really moving, she had, had just come out of hospital um, having tried to commit suicide. And there we were confronted with this girl. She probably was only 15. Uh, it was heartbreaking, really. And, and she looked a mess. I mean, uh, she had just come out. She was recovering from, you know, nearly killing herself. And, um, and yet there was an incredible beauty about her because she'd survived and she'd fought it. And there she was standing with us. And you could just sort of feel the grace of God around her, you know? Um, and so that song came from, from meeting her and, you know, that line, she's as pretty as hell. Um, obviously well, quite provocative. That line, didn't it? Well, stupidly it did. I mean, um, but I mean, it's a beautiful picture of, of someone that did look <laughs> pretty beat up and yet look beautiful at the same time. And, and of course the song, if you actually listen, if those people actually listen to the song is actually a song of hope and life and encouragement and redemption. Um, but um, yeah, that was part of the crazy world of Christian music in America, especially of having to write to bookstores to say, please, would you like, like the record and uh, you know there is this reference in there but it's, isn't it funny looking back now well it reminds me of that sort of that thing what um in the 60s where uh john lennon said oh we you know we're, we're bigger than jesus mm. and they burn beatles records um in yeah hires in the bible belt but anyway we won't talk about that and uh we'll, we'll move swiftly on um Amazing record. You then had a quick follow-up, didn't you? With Glow yeah. the following year. Yeah. How, how much of those two albums were sort of almost birthed at the same time or, or were they quite distinct? Well, sonically, I think they're like brother, they're two brothers in the same family. Um, I think that we were just so excited at that time. So, you know, it, it was like we'd been let loose. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we were starting to play really well together as a band. I think that's what I remember from that time. There's sort of a moment in a band's life where you, things click. Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't have been able to make Glow four years earlier. But, you know, we went to a great studio in Brighton, which doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. Big old church building. They turn it into a studio. We set up on the floor. And for two weeks, we just played. And I think that's what you can hear in that record is, is five people making music together. Uh, especially you can hear like Stu Smith coming into his own. Just some really interesting sounds, great grooves, you know, sitting back on it. And, and, and confidence, you can hear confidence in a band that had been together a few years and like, right, we are, you know, we're a band of brothers, we're a team, and, and we sound great. Yeah. And so let's, let, let's record ourselves. Um, and we had an interesting engineer on that project called Charles Zwicky, uh, a guy called Ted T helped produce it. And again, I think you can just see that those two people around us were opening up doors for us. Yeah. It was the first time they forced... Tim to go on a Fender Road and like scrap all his digi gear, all his D50s, synth sounds, pads, it, it, it had all gone. He was like, no, we're not going to use that. Everything was a Fender Road through guitar pedals, weird stuff. And I think 
it was it was it's crazy, but I mean, I don't. Is there a record like it in, in in that sense? You know, it was it was just an expression of life and like a bomb going off, really. Um, yeah, really exciting. It, it it sounds all the things you've described to me um, like a band being let loose and uh, the creative freedom I think you found because there's those segments between songs that are more instrumental and sort of um, expand on some of the ideas in the songs like Jesus Blood and then you've got that sort of amazing string section that follows it and uh, closes the album I think but like no one was no one was doing that certainly in the scene yeah. it came from um, but but it's it It'd be true to say that there was a, a focus again, perhaps congrega congregationally in those songs on Glow. Mm. And then again, pretty hot off the back of Glow, you're back in the studio and the following year, this one comes out. So I've got two yeah. these here because there's the English or the UK release, which is called Audio Lesson Over, which I'll get you to explain in a second. And then there's yeah. the American uh, release with, of a very similar bunch of songs but with I think a few that are different um, called Touch and they're, they're sort of yes you know very yeah. closely related similar in, in lots yeah. of things, but I think slightly different mixes and things on the American one to the English one and different running order so I think Ch Chuck Zwicky that you, you're just talking about with Glow is your engineer Charles Zwicky he went to yeah. produce this didn't he he did, yeah. So this is a crazy one because a lot of people, um, I think, that I was aware of at the time, bought it, rushed off to, to buy it and uh, off the back of Glow, really, and were very surprised mm. that it was so different. How would you describe approaching this one? Well, again, um, <laughs> we were always ones to change. but. Um, we we got Chuck in. We decided to record on sixteen track two inch tape. So we were again going away from the computer, cutting stuff live to tape. So you can hear again. There's less on that record. There's less stuff on it. it it's drums, bass, electric. You know, it's it's more basic, um, but really well recorded. It's crunchy. You know, we had to cut direct to tape. So you can hear that in there. Um, I don't think all the songs were, were great, in my, in my opinion. I think they could have been better, but there are some really great songs on there, too. What are your um, favorites? Well, my favourites? Um, well, I, I've forgotten what's on there. I'm just going <laughs> to look it up. Let's quickly look at these. Wait um, summer. Take me away. Love is the compass. Alien. Yeah. Angel in disguise. Roller coaster. Yeah. Fire. There is an angel. Uh, Vice called gasoline. A little love. Show me heaven. America. And stealing time. That's the audio lesson over version. Yeah, yeah. We've got touch as an additional uh, track on uh, on this one. On the, on the American one, yeah. Um, a lot of these tracks sounded great live, actually. Uh, I remember them sounding really tough, like pro pro proper, you know, we were growing as a band, the crowds were getting bigger. Songs like Fire, Take Me Away was sounding big live. Um, Stealing Time is beautiful. Yeah, so, some of these cuts are really heavy, like really fuzzy bass right up in your face here in the mix and I know. really heavy fuzzed out guitars as well so it's it i remember seeing you live at the time and it was it was a much heavier experience than we would have seen a few years prior to that i know and and i think that we <laughs> there were no rules in our minds i don't i don't i don't think that we realized we were sort of within a genre i think we just were, were just excited to be making music and i think looking back if there's one thing i could say 
about all of this is that sometimes we miss the really good A&R guy in the process because, you know, we were five guys following our nose all the time. We, you know, we're running our own company, our own label, pretty much doing what we wanted. I think if I listen back to all the records now, I think there's probably two or three songs that didn't need to be on them. Personally, you know, they, we could have trimmed them back or saved them or rewritten them. But that's just my own personal opinion, being super critical. Um, or maybe someone to say, hey, I, I think that song just needs a little bit more time to finish it. Let's push it over the edge. But, you know, like you're learning as you're going. I mean, you don't, it's only when you look back, you realize those things. But at the time, you're just, just, you're just throwing all this stuff at the wall. <laughs> Some quite psychedelic stuff on Audio Less Nova. And it almost sounds like some of you have been listening to the sort of late 60s Beatles. Um, there's that kind of, um, you know, uh, that harmonium sound in there. And um, yeah, string yeah. sections yeah. That are almost quite um, whimsical and, and like uh, George Martin style. Um, it, it's funny how English the, this one sounds in, in that way. Um, songs near the end that are quite yeah. strange. Like, what, what is Bicycle Gasoline? What's that about? <laughs> I, well, that's actually Stu G's line. Um, what a brilliant title. I mean, of course, a bicycle doesn't need gasoline. So he runs on bicycle gasoline and something about violence in there. I know it's so clever, isn't it? Um, you know, I, I, I think of all the times that I'm, I try and like give my wife the things I think that she would love and need. And I usually it's the wrong thing. <laughs> so it's like, I don't, I don't want bicycle gasoline. You know, <laughs> <laughs> do you remember that fast show sketch when the, the exasperated wife is always waiting for um, Mark Williams's character to come home, and she's always like, "Did you get the potatoes, love?" And then Mark Williams is like, "Even better than that," and has a bunch of crazy things that no one needs. No, yeah. I've, I've got this. <laughs> I've got this model ship. And, you know, she's just always exasperated because uh, she's gone send, sending him out for some groceries and he's come back with something completely uh, pointless. And uh, maybe that's a new way to understand that song. Uh, yeah. Gasoline. Um, stealing Time, another yeah. one. Close yeah, out I, I think... That. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um... Another Stoogy song that originated in his head. Um, the idea of, you know, you know, to get to to make sense of things, to capture the beauty in the day, to do something great with your time. Mm -hmm. You have to. It doesn't. It doesn't come to you for free. You've got to go and steal it. You know, you, you've got to go and be a thief and take it off the shelf and bring it to you. And, then, and, and, you know, because time just disappears. Time is expensive. And so, and we were busy as a band. You know, we were away a lot, all had kids, married families. So I think it was a great, you could, you can sort of hear the, the earnest, the yearning in there of, wow, our lives are like going so fast. And we've got to consciously steal time from each day to be with the people that we love. Um, so yeah, I, I, important song. I think with all these songs, you know, um, 60% of them just go under the sort of radar of the general listener. But, um, I think now people hopefully years on have got ears to hear that there's some amazing sort of messages about life in them. Yeah, and musically, I, I was listening to this last night, and I think, I think 
it could be some of Tim's best stuff. There's, I think, hmm. on um, Angel in Disguise, there's this kind of piano yeah. breakdown in the middle of the song, and there's sort of flutes in there, and it just goes into this pastoral little sort of segue, and Tim's just opening up. He's just playing beautiful piano. Um, yeah. That happens a couple mm. of times on this album. Yeah. You really hear Tim just stretching his leg as a Yeah, he's a Yeah, he's a great um he's a great pianist, Tim. Um and you know you put him on a real piano, especially a grand piano, and he will just come alive. He's very very gifted like that. Um and so it was always a regret of ours that we couldn't take a grand piano on the road uh, because, you know, that would have been an amazing dimension. But he also has good ears as well. So he, he, he had a lot of attention to detail and would often come in the studio at the end of the day and say, hey, what, what about this? What about that? What if you did this? So he was always a great set of ears. Yeah. Um, but, but, yeah, he... Uh, you know, he's always emotional what he brought. I had the honour of having him play on one of my early Chaos Curb songs. He came in to Paul Burton's and um, played piano. And uh, yeah, it was so great. He's just got a touch. He's just got an amazing touch. Yeah, isn't that great? Yeah, beautiful. Um, and the other thing I wanted to comment on on, on this album is your vocals. Because I don't think we hear many delirious albums where you're as vulnerable as you sound on this one. Is I don't know if you recognise that. How do how do you feel about that? Because it's I hear a lot of vulnerability and it almost kind of there's a shakiness in your voice. I don't. I, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but it's not as bold and mm. sort of triumphant sounding as Glow or World Service, which comes after this one. Interesting. Well, um, I think partly I remember Chuck saying, look, we're, we're not going to mess around here. Look, I don't want you on a big studio mic in a booth. Uh, you're on an SM58 on a cable in the room, standing next to me, and you're just going to belt this out. And we're going to do one or two takes and that's it. That's all you've got. But what what you do is got to be, you got to go there. Wow. So, um, I, I I did you know so that it, I think it's um, not as polished as some of the other sonically put together pieces of music and vocals, of course. But it sound you know it was a band kind of record off the floor. And uh, yeah, it's quite exciting. So I'm gonna I'm gonna skip on now quite a few years because Delirious made several more albums that were sort of, um, if I can briefly sum them up, as sort of refocused again more at the sort of the congregational thing. Um, yeah, big songs that the church was singing all over the world. Um, and the band comes to an end in 2009, as, as bands tend to do. Yeah. And then some more years go by, and there's, a, there's 16 years between Audio Lesson Over, which I think is an anagram of Radio One Loves Us. Yeah, quite cheeky, because of course they didn't love us. So it was quite a cheeky album title. Um, 16, 2001, and then in 2017, this one emerges after a few years of kind of being incubated and uh, mm. dreamt up. Um, mm. And Army of Bones is sort of another one of your secret, well, not secret, but sort of less known works. And yeah. I, obviously I have a personal attachment to this one. Um, yeah. Because, you know, I shared a lot of this journey with you and yeah. it's, hard, yeah. it's hard to be, uh, <laughs> Hard to be objective about it for me, yeah, but yeah. I, I hear a link here between the, the sort of the journey that you leave off on 
here with stealing time, I hear being picked up in a way, and I said this to you just before we started recording, but stealing time is in the same key as Don't Be Long, uh, which kicks off this record, Army of Bones. Yeah, interesting, yeah. And there's this kind of amazing, for me, like an amazing link there, because I listened to one after the other last night in preparation for this interview, because I'm a... Well done, well done. Yeah. I'm a pro, I'm not, but you know. Um, and I, let's, let's quickly talk about the journey to this. How on earth did you end up sure. making a record that isn't a Martin Smith record and isn't a Delirious record? What is this? Well, I mean, obviously the band ended. I, I, you know, I managed to start to gather a great team around me, a different set of guys, younger guys, actually. Uh, a lot of who were just starting out, I'm uh, thinking of Ruben Haas and um, I would say a, a good drummer, uh, but needed time and, and experience to go to being a great drummer. And of course, he's a, one of the best drummers in the UK now. So just, you know, that's a message to all musos out there is that nothing really comes quickly uh, in terms of honing your skill, talent, you know, in the end, it becomes more about what you don't play than what you do play. Um, and so, you know, I went on the road with these guys, Johnny Bird, Steve Evans. Um, we did a lot of stuff in the church gospel scene, of course. That's one of the things I love to do. Um, but because we're a bit, bit of an odd bunch, um, a lot of wildness in there still, we thought, well, you know, start a band. Let's call it something different. Let's make some music that we would love to make. And so we went in the studio, the four of us, and it, and it is literally a four-piece, you can hear it's four-piece playing, uh, playing those songs. For me, I had lots of songs in me which I knew I couldn't do on a Sunday morning. And I would say that it was the, this song is really, this, this whole record is a love letter to my wife. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's, it's one of the most open love letters ever, where I'm saying, look, you know, we've come so far. We're, we're 20, 23 years in or whatever, tw you know, and we're still going. And it's a miracle sometimes when I look back at, what we've had to go through, um, you know, just time away and stresses on that and our family, you know, we're, we're here and we love each other. And, uh, at, well, one of the questions, is, you know, do you love me still? You know, should we, should we do this? Um, and, uh, you know, we're now up to 25 years. So we're very grateful for that. Uh, but of course, anyone knows being married or ever, Everything requires a lot of work and commitment. And so the, the, all these lyrics are about me saying, look, uh, I, I desperately want to hang on to this. I desperately love you, uh, but I'm really painfully aware of my own issues and, you know, stupid things that I do, uh, <laughs> which can sometimes jeopardize what we have. And so, um, I hope that in the end, uh, you know, it, it will be an encouragement to some people. Um, again, again, I think if you've got ears to hear and you dig deep into it, um, in some ways it's, it's some of the best work I've ever done. Mm -hmm. Um, some of the most honest songs I've ever written, you know, we sort of, I, I felt like I needed to take the mask off and just sing about what was really on my heart. And, um, and, and that is it, Army of Bones. And I think the Bones theme runs right the way through the spine of that record is, of course, we are, you know, we're just flesh and bone, aren't we? And sometimes our bones break. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but believing that God can put the bones back together. And, and that is what I believe. And I think that's what he does do. And that's a theme, of course, that you revisit very strongly on 
on your most recent work, which we will look at in a sec. But uh, just to just to jump in on a couple of these songs, because again, there's a sort of there's a heaviness um, in this music that we hadn't really heard from your songs for a while. Not just sonically heavy, but lyrically heavier as well. So, um, dead in the water. <laughs> yeah. What's, what's that one about? Well, it's a, it's a picture of sort of how you'd imagine if you were drowning and, and, you, and you're sort of going down and you're looking up at your life that once was and you're seeing it all up there and, and desperately wanting someone to pull you up. Um, so that, that song is all about that. Of, of, you know, are, are we going to make this through? Is what, what's happening here? I'm sure a lot of us could identify with that sense of losing grip and you know going down down and down and then not quite sure you know what what to hang on to who to hang on to uh trying to make sense of your, your life you know um uh, i think there's a line in there about i see a movie playing out or something my life's like a movie and i think some of us have, have that sense of you go through life and sometimes it is it's your, your life watching a movie and it's of yourself and you you wish it could be better you know it's a cinematic album in, in as much as it's got this grand sweep to it in in the, the production and the kind of the imagery um i think i remember talking to you about music videos at the time and about how we could almost do a sort of concept mm. film around it it be a soundtrack to something but then you've got songs like batteries which sounds really bleak like some of these like, take my batteries out you know i'm it sounds like a person who's very tired and of course there's right. a twist in the lyric but there's there's a real vulnerability to a song like that what yeah I, I, I think is 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 what was there any kind of self-limiting on how vulnerable, vulnerable you were going to be on this record? No, I, not really. I had a great guy producing this record, a guy called Geth Pearson, a Welsh guy. And he, you know, he's not, he wasn't from my world or church or nothing. You know, he's just a great producer in his own right. And he came at it very intentionally like i need every single lyric you're singing to make sense to me i i want to believe it and I, I need to believe every single word you're saying and if i don't we're, then we're not going to use it so don't dress it up i, I want to hear you know i, I want to hear what's what you got to say so i fell in love with actually he all the double track vocals, all the layers. I mean, we spent hours and hours, it drove me nuts. Layering vocals, just sounds and... So he brought that very much, that, that tone to it. Also, it's the first record we recorded in 432 hertz. So normally, you know, for years I've been recording 440, but we, it's a slight pitch down. It, it sounds a little bit dirtier little bit more vinyl like and um i really like how my voice sounds in 432 um so we were experimenting and he was pushing me hard to sort of like come on let out what's in there you you know you, you've you, you've lived this life i want to hear i, I want to hear about it it it's there's a cost to this record um, not, I'm not talking about financial cost. I'm talking about artistic, I guess, and personally on you. How, when you look at this now, a few years later, what emotions do you feel? Uh, I'm really proud actually of it. I'm proud of the guys. I think we're all proud of it, the four of us, um, because I think a lot of um, 
and I don't mean this in a bad way, but my experience of a lot of Christian music is that it's it's built for that particular consumer to consume and help them. It's got to be theologically correct. And I love all that, and I'm a part of that world. But I think where the bravery was in this record was just... But there are certain times as an artist you have to tell the truth on how this all works for you. And, and, and sometimes I can't say all that I want to say in that particular genre because it doesn't work. Um, and, you know, this was a real chance for me to sort of open up another doorway and, and explain that, well, you know, just because I'm, I do this and do that and, um, you know, I can um, sing, sing God songs that touch people. It doesn't mean that also there's a part of me that struggles in certain areas, uh, as like with most people, with every person would. And, and I need to, to, to present this message of hope that I sincerely believe in. I've got to present the whole picture. I can't just keep presenting one slice of it, which kind of is a bit shiny and keeps everyone happy and, and, and makes my brand look fantastic. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I just felt like I needed to present the psalmic nature of what it's like to live on this planet, be a human being. You know, we aren't God. Um, and I think it was healthy for me to present that holistic picture of, of, of someone married with six kids trying to do his life, play music, write music. Um, An insatiable and, drug habit. <laughs> well, thankfully, I've not been drawn to that, but um, I'd yes, be a nightmare. I've seen I? your coffee machine. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I do drink a lot of coffee. Um, and I've started running, so that's my new drug. Uh, yeah, yeah. So my wife's biggest drug is, um, is running. Yeah. And then crack. Um, I'm joking. So the, uh, for those of you who don't understand my humour... Oh, you, most of you will, so it's fine. The Day the Fire Went Out. Oh, man, that's a song. Painful to listen to for me. Um, in all the right ways, I like painful songs. Um, at the time all of this was happening, and, um, you know, we were working together quite a lot, you and I, and I was going through some stuff, and this song, oh, it, it just... It just summed up so much of that time for me. Um, why did you end the album with a song like that? And what is it about? Um, I think I put myself in that position, that dark place of imagining what would life be without, without Anna. Um, you know, what, what would my life be if she wasn't here? And, and it was incomprehensible. Um, so it, it, it's as much of, as a warning, that song, uh, you know, to, to sort of, let's not let this fire go out. Let's, let's keep this burning. Um, and let's celebrate what we have. You know, we, this is amazing what we have. So let's not take for granted. We should we should dance together more. And uh, hello, mate. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Hello. You're right. Red food coloring. If we do, it will be. In yeah, the you need that. I mean, it's brilliant, isn't it? Like we, you know, the family. Uh, Dynamic, it's so powerful, isn't it? And and of course, we all fight. You know, you got kids, I got kids. It's a very real fight to keep that together. And and I think that if you can, um, 
make it through, you know, through all the ups and it, you know, it's got to be the biggest reward in life, isn't it? The biggest prize to not bottle it too early. And, and, you know, of course I'm not, I understand there's some very real issues, you know, I'm not saying all of that, you know, some powerful things that happen in people's lives, very traumatic things, but, um, I, th I think I'm more speaking to myself that, you know, I've got to stop myself being an idiot and, um, you know, and, and take care of the fire, take care of that. And, and that song, you know, don't let the fire go out. You know, I'm responsible for that. It's not just going to happen. I, 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 I can stay away from the things that get me in trouble mm -hmm. to keep that fire going. And yeah, a great way to end a record. Yeah, very much so. Very, the, the fade out on that track as well is, is a beautiful way to, to leave that record. I've had several friends on Facebook ask, will there be any more Army of Bones music in the future? I'd like to think there will be. Um, the truth is it was, it was very difficult to sustain it. Um, four guys playing in a club with, you know, 27 people, um, you know, all with families. And it was a really tough thing to sustain in our, in our ordinary lives. You know, um, it, the problem was we weren't 16 just sleeping on a floor and driving in a transit, you know, we, we, we've all got other things going on. And I think it, um, so I'm being totally honest there. It was, but I think it will come again. And I think more music will come. Uh, there is one more song actually that's done released that I'm thinking of might slip out in the near future. Oh, is that an exclusive? Yeah, it, it didn't make the record, but I might just put it out for the summer. I think it could be good. Oh, gonna you want to give away the name of it? No, I can't. Oh, you, I'd have to kill you, Dave. I've probably got it. Yeah, you've probably got it, yeah. Somewhere. Yeah, this probably. There was probably during that writing time, you'd send me um, demos of things, and there's, I think I've got four or five tracks that never got completed that sort of... Yeah. Yeah, brilliant songs, all of yeah. them. Um, yeah, thanks. Let, let's jump a couple of years into the future then from, from this one, 2017, when this came out. And your most recent album. Yeah. And there's all sorts of sort of visual clues that speak of the Army of Bones sort of um, preceding it, which yeah, which are to do with the chevrons that you used as a sort of good old map used in the, yeah. the um, design process for this. Yeah, and yeah. Used a lot on sort of on your clothes and, and some of the merchandise and things like that. And we see it again in the artwork. Yes. The Iron Lung, which is yeah. beautiful. And uh, on your jacket there as well. Yeah, yeah. And I love yeah. the way that you've tied the sort of the two projects together. Hmm. So this is much more aimed, uh, I'm guessing, given that it's on a label that's sort of a gospel label. Uh, uh, yeah for that audience again, but there's a lot sonically that sounds mm -hmm. in the same vein. Your, yeah. your writing approach, what made this album a Martin Smith record, not an Army of Bones record? Uh, that's a very good question, because it's the same band, pretty yeah. much. Same team, you can hear that in there. Um, I think that I I needed to reach out to the wider audience again. And I had some of those songs like Exult and Fire's Gonna Fall that I think were needed for the church to sing. So it felt like an, a logical thing. But also the Chevrons was my way of saying, look, I'm the same guy there as I am here. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't changed. I'm the same person. I just had different things in me that, you know, di different songs, different expressions, but I'm the same guy. I'm not kind of 
split in two. Uh, I'm a whole person that wants to sing about the fire, wants to sing about uh, you know, my wife, wants to sing about love, wants to sing about my faith in God. Uh, you know, and, and, the, and the older I get, I want to celebrate that wholeness more. I don't want to compartmentalize my life into sort of different sections that compete with each other. I want it to be sit within my frame in a really comfortable way. Mm. Uh, and they do, you know, and, and the more I'm at peace with that, the, the easier it's become. You know, I'm not fighting any of them. I think that becomes confusing for people. Maybe it's like, oh, what, what, what's Martin doing now? Is he, is he this? Is he that? But um, yeah, I mean, I haven't figured myself out yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, um, you know, you you let music speak for itself, don't you? In the end, um, but uh, no, I appreciate that. But Iron Lung is my story. You know, when I was a well, when I was a baby, I nearly died of respiratory problems and bronchial pneumonia, and so amazing for this time. Um, Iron Lung was a weird song to come out a year ago, but now it sort of makes sense, really, that we have a world that's struggling to breathe, and of course, it's so many layers to that, you know, and. Uh, you know, we, we've got the challenge on the respiratory system and COVID and coronavirus and, um, but, you know, God knows. So, um, you know, and he breathed life into my lungs as a baby and uh, little did I know that I'd go on to be singing songs. So it's, it's a great story. Yeah, there's, there's a few songs on here that I feel like are kind of, could be on an Army of Bones album, Runaway. Yeah. Almost, always Be My Luck. Kind of, in fact- Which was a nice, a nice co-write. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, always a a little co-write with you. Yeah. I'm a massive mm. honor for me. Um, the Always Be My Love, I think was a rid, that, that was, a runner for Army of Bones, wasn't it? It was a round. Yeah. Not finished. It was. It was a heavier version. And um, I, I slowed it down and made it a little bit more personal, I think, which I think was good in the end. Yeah. Um, you know, like it, it's actually, we use these terms quite liberally, you know, in terms of like in a worship contest, uh, you know, God, you'll always be my love. But of course, we know in reality that's not always true. Mm. You know, we're distracted. We we fall in love with other things, and so I think as my wife saying, "Look, I I want this to be true. God, you know my heart, but you know I let you down. But despite of that, um, I think that's where you, you you sort of know you find out who I am." Yeah, it it's it's a vulnerable. It's another very vulnerable song, which is a kind of I guess a theme that I've touched on several times in this chat is the vulnerability that you know this one, um, and then Army of Bones and then Iron Lung. Sort of there's a a vulnerable thread that runs through all of them. That and actually the end of Mesomorphous, I'd say, is pretty pretty vulnerable. So I'm going to shut the door while they're cooking. <laughs> uh, nearly done nearly done um so there we are there's a bit of a journey there touching on some of your work um i guess the question some would like to ask you is is where do you feel you're going next because in a sense you've never sort of played to expectation yeah you've always followed your nose as you put it and yeah. do you have any yeah. anything of 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 where Martin Smith's creative muse will lead him next? No, I don't. Um, but I'd like it to be more collaborative. There's, there's so many people 
who I admire, you know, so many singers and artists that I'd love to, you know, do something together with a lot more people. Um, that would be fun. Uh, and, you know, maybe keep breaking the walls down, especially between the, 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 the sort of Christian music scene and mainstream, you know, so many walls built there. Um, but I, but I would love to see some of those walls come down and see some people working together a bit more. Um, you know, I know people from the pop mainstream side that would say, Oh, I'd love to write a church song with you, you know? And, and then I, there's people from the worship side say, Oh, I'd love to write uh, some melodies for a dance song, you know, I'll just get a groove and write a top line. I think that would be, both would benefit. And so um, I, I'd like to be a part of that, I think. Uh, but no, Dave, I don't know the answer to that. I'm in lockdown at home. I'm busy with kids and mm -hmm. less creative than I would imagine at this time because I'm just, you know, you know, being around. Yeah. But I'm I'm giving my time self time to see what comes, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, see what songs that need to be sung in this in this moment, and and so I'm waiting. Great answer. Um, I'm going to jump to a couple of questions from friends on Facebook. Yeah, let's see what they've asked. Matt Ellis asks, did you get my last email? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> okay. Um, but I've been talking to Dave Griffiths too much, so, you know, I, I haven't had time yet. Um, let's see. Somebody asks... My friend Tim Clark, do you still have that bright yellow Winmore Park shirt from when Delirious sponsored us as a church football team? I'm sorry, I don't have it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> wow, that was dramatic, wasn't it? Yeah. Most that exciting thing to happen for days. Wow. I know. How exciting is that? Wow. The, the, yeah, kids coming in, alarms going off. It's all very raw. I know. So my friend know. Chris Mears asks, could you ask Martin, when you were making Mesomorphous, did you ever feel like you wanted to be a regular slash secular band without the expectations of the church? Yeah, I think we did. Um, but we also realised that we were church guys. You know, we'd come out of that we were fully involved still in our church. You know, you could never take that out of us. And so, yes, we had ideas of becoming the next Radiohead in U2, but, um, you know, maybe our calling was different. And we, we, we just accepted that and just did the best we could. Thank you, that's great. Oh, juicy question here. My friend Nick asks, can you ask him if Les Moyer and the like restricted the band's production and pressed the generic Christian sound button to amuse the masses, or did they have free reign like any band should have? <laughs> um, well, Les Moyer is, is an amazing guy, and in fact, actually, contrary to what people might think, he would push me to be more of myself in that sense. But yes, you know, there are people in the mix that um, are happy to let you record an album and then say, oh, can we have an acoustic version of it for a radio station in America? Because what you've done is a bit too angry or a bit too loud for them. So can we have a and you think that's fine, you know, I can do that. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, actually, the guys in the UK, I would say, are all very supportive and right, let's get behind you. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about the uh, controversial nature of some of these questions, but, you know, we, um, we're not trying to cast any aspersions. This is just what's come to me from Facebook. 
My friend, dear friend, Grant, asks... Oh, oh. Yeah. Do you think that the Christian record industry, as well as the church, should actively encourage musicians to take risks, experiment and forge new paths from a musical perspective? Or is it better that Christian slash church artists are steered to create music that is safer and less edgy in order to achieve better commercial success and potentially reach more people. So yeah. should, well, should we take risks or play it safe in order to reach more people with a sort of a wider yeah, I mean, I mean, approach? Yeah, I mean, I mean that's a long, that's a two hour answer, isn't it? And <laughs> it all comes down to who you are. It depends what your nature is, what your calling is. I mean, I've got, you know, so many close friends. Um, you know, if you go back years and years, you know, you know, my, my great friend, Matt Redman, similar age, yep. you know, Matt's calling absolutely was to write hymns that church people could sing. And, and, and you, he's done an incredible job at that. Um, he wouldn't have said that he was an artist or, you know, sort of that way inclined, but just, oh, I want to write songs that people can sing. Mm. And I think he's been true to that. The fruit is amazing. And, you know, he's chosen that path. And I, I, I think, well done, that's brilliant. Um, for me, um, you know, I've enjoyed, I, I've enjoyed the different aspects of artists and background so sonically I was it was a bit easy for me to sort of experiment possibly and we're all different aren't we and I think we be true to who you are and, and and I think that's all you can do to be honest well I've got one one last question which was very very quickly what is this is from me what is people's biggest misconception about you? <laughs> um, wow. Um, oh, that's a very good question. You'd have to ask people around me, but um, um, I'm more, probably more sort of grounded and down to earth and laddie than people <laughs> will go out to see Brighton play. I've got two sons, you know, uh, and my, that are probably more normal, you know, like, um, yes, I can put some headphones on and put a guitar and I can become that character, but, you know, 90% of my life is just, um, I enjoy being at home and, you know, do, doing all the jobs at home and, you know, being a part of my family's life. And so, yeah, maybe, I don't know, you'd have to ask my kids that. Yeah, I think having got to know you, I was surprised in a good way by your sense of humour being quite laddie in a, in right. a, you know, we've had, there's some, there's some very fond memories of things that have happened that <laughs> have made us laugh and it's, <laughs> yeah. And it's yeah. <laughs> I think there's, there's a, <laughs> oh, let's just leave it there. <laughs> See you soon. Bye. Bye. <laughs>